for calling in today and participating um, in this ongoing effort that we've, that we've been working on. So I've been working closely um, with a group of folks, um, including Molly McCammon, who is my co-lead for this IARPIC body, which is hosting this call today. So IARPIC, for those of you who might not be familiar, since I think we have some new people on the line, is the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. And Molly and I have been leading up this effort to help improve coordination of harmful algal bloom research, um, particularly in the Bering Strait region, but just in generally the Arctic um, this summer. And we picked up um, probably around January or February. And so rolling into the field season, we've been um, figuring out our way and um, working with all of you to really leverage um, different field opportunities that were already funded where um, people could perhaps collect some extra samples as a part of this effort or are just participating in, in sharing the results um, with a greater group of people. And so this particular call today, um, which we're calling our mid-season check-in, is um, the second call in a series of three where we're checking in with scientists who have been working with us, going out into the region and, and collecting observations. Um, and so our first call was at the end of July, and that um, really focused on reporting out from the NPRB Asgard crews. We had Dean Stockwell on the line giving some updates on his observations. And we also had Jackie Grebmeyer, who's on the line again today, um, talking with us about some of her physical um, observations and some of the um, benthic ecosystem changes that she's been observing. And so um, since that July call, we've had a couple of research cruises that have gone out, including a cruise that's funded by the office that I work for, um, which is NOAA's Arctic Research Program. So we had a cruise on the Healy in August. So we have Don Anderson, who's going to report out on some of his preliminary observations from that cruise. And then we also had two um, partnering fisheries cruises. And we're going to hear from um, Lisa Eisner, as well as hopefully Jeff Knapp will be able to join us. I don't think he's on the line so far about some of their preliminary observations they made in the region and um, some of the extra sampling that they did as a part of um, this project. And then also lined up in our agenda today is um, we hope to hear from Steve Kibler, who is down um, in the Beaufort lab in North, sorry, in the Carolinas, and also Chris Holderied, who is going to give us a Kachemak Bay update and Kari, who's going to give us a sea tour update as well. So we really hope that this is just um, a way that we can share observations um, of things that have been going on in the regions relevant to HABs um, and just general physical changes that are going on that might um, increase the prevalence of HABs um, in the region as well. And so we do plan on having a third and final follow-up call at the end of the season, which will probably be sometime um, at the end of November. And the ultimate goal of, of these check-ins and this coordination effort is to create some sort of end of season th synthesis that pulls together all of these um, coordinated observations that people have been making so that we can really have one place to look next year when we're thinking about um, how the season, the two seasons compare um, and just trying to be a little bit more op um, organized and, and pulling our um, observations together across um, different research efforts. Um, and so without further ado, I think I will turn it over so we can start our report out. So these are going to be um, just informal report outs, five to ten minutes. I think some of you have slides, um, and if you don't, no problem there. Um, and then we will wrap up with an introduction to a research workspace and a place where we can share information and talk about um, future work at the end of the call. And so I'm going to turn it over and stop sharing my screen and give the reins to Don Anderson, who will be giving our first update. And I guess before I turn it over to Don, if anyone has any um, questions or comments after that quick introduction, feel free to take yourself off mute and, and hop in. It's a really informal kind of exchange. So I hope that you feel comfortable um, making comments if you have any. Emily? Yes. This is Elizabeth in Juneau. Hi, Just Elizabeth. in terms of timing for that end of field season wrap up, yes. we will make the final presentation of the Eastern Bering Sea status report to the council in the first week in December. Okay. I don't know if that you know, might align really well if people are comfortable, if there's some sort of synthesis story that people are comfortable 
giving, if it's preliminary information, that's okay. The inclusion in the status report doesn't prevent, you know, publication elsewhere of information. It's just to get the information to the man fisheries management process so they can consider it when they're looking at quotas. So Good. I'll just leave that there and, and listen to the updates. Yes, I will definitely keep that in mind. And I will touch base with you because that would be really great to incorporate some of kind of our general observations gleaned from the season. So thank you for that, Elizabeth. Yep, thank you. Emily, this is Gay Sheffield in Nome. Hi, Gay. I am, I'm able to get in by phone, so I don't know if I show up on your roster. Thank you. I don't see you, but I'm so glad you're able to call in. Thank you, Gay. Hello, this is Kristen Cecil in Juno. I also am calling in by phone, so I'm not sure if I'm on your roster. Okay, gotcha, Kristen. Thank you. Doug Cosley from Anchorage, and I'm joining by phone as well. Hi, Doug. Thanks for calling in today. Jeff Knapp in Seattle, Washington, also calling in by phone. Hey, Jeff. Great to have you. Good turnout. Okay, so Don, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, uh, can you see the slides on the screen? Yes, I can. You can hear me, great. Uh, all right, so hello everybody. Uh, what we're going to talk about are the uh, results is predominantly from the uh, Healy 1801 cruise. I'll, just a little tiny bit of background here. There are, are uh, I know some people I know who uh, know every bit of what I'm going to say, but others may not. There's there's really two species that two hab species that we're the most concerned with right now in the uh, in the Arctic region. One is called Alexandrium catenella. It produces this uh, saxitoxin, a whole family of saxitoxins that are responsible for paralytic shellfish bruising and can cause some uh, wildlife mortalities as well. Um, and an important part of this organism's uh, bloom dynamics is that it has a, a dormant or insisted stage that you see down here in the, the right. So this is all the same species, but these are cysts that, that stay in the sediment for much of the year and then germinate and start the bloom. Uh, so these, these are the uh, overwintering stage of Alexandrium. Uh, it's important to recognize that one of the major drivers of cyst germination is... Can, can I ask somebody to put themselves on mute? Yeah, we're getting a little bit of feedback. If everyone can just go and make sure that you're on mute. Okay. Um, Still getting a little bit of feedback. There we go. Okay, I think that should be better. All right. So it's important to, to know that, that one of the, the biggest factors is temperature in terms of uh, uh, germination timing. And so uh, an understanding and a, and a measurements in fact of bottom water temperatures are critical in trying to understand the dynamics of this, um, this organism up in that region. Um, historically, if we go back to 2013, our Japanese colleagues, you can see in the lower right here, uh, measured uh, cyst abundance in a few places, and you can see this huge uh, black circle. That's extremely high cyst abundance. It's higher than we ever typically find out here in the northeast part of the U.S. and higher than most places anywhere in the world, uh, right there in the Chukchi. And so the origin of those cysts and the origin of the blooms that might occur are, uh, are obviously of great, great interest. Now the other one that the other hab species we worry about is um, Pseudonychia. A, uh, this, is a, this is a diatom that produces demoic acid that in humans causes amnesia, shellfish poisoning, or in marine uh, mammals and other animals, uh, it's called demoic acid poisoning or DAP. Um, and his, if you look at the literature, there's, a, there's about eight different Pseudonychia species identified in the Arctic and uh, Several of those are toxic forms, are known to be toxic, um, but they're very, very little. It's known about Pseudonychia up there. And uh, I think we're gonna need, because of difficulties in identifying and distinguishing between the different species, some molecular methods are gonna be 
needed to provide the resolution we need about the species composition. So for 1801 and 1801 and 1803, we had these objectives: basically determine the distribution of the planktonic species to collect surface sediments to document the uh, and map out the prevalence of these Alexandrium cysts and identify the major seedbeds, and then to assess the community population structure of these two species as they occur in the water. So here are the cruise tracks for 1801 on the left and 1803 on the right. And uh, you can sort of see that together they will give this domain that stretches from Nome all the way into the Beaufort Sea. So by the time these cruises are over, we'll have uh, twice as much data as I'll show you today, but also uh, really a nice map of both the cell abundance and the uh, cyst distribution over that large area. Um, what we did, or will do, um, just straight water collections from several depths, looking for uh, Sidonich, I'll explain a bit later, we're doing a, a DNA basis and some toxin analysis for demolic acid. And we're, we're going to be doing um, just basically uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization is the best way to be counting, we believe the best way to be counting Alexandrium uh, on, on these types of, of samples. Uh, on the surface sediment, we're counting the cysts up and we're gonna be using many of these cultures to look at uh, using microsatellites and other approaches to look at connectivity in the, the population. So uh, some, another, another important feature of our methodology was that we put this instrument called the IFCD, the Imaging Flow Cytobot, on the, uh, on the Healy. You can see it over here on the right, uh, strapped to these pipes. It is an underwater microscope, a very, very powerful and useful instrument that was then uh, doing continuous sampling from the underwater seawater line, three times an hour, it pulls 20 mils of, uh, I'm sorry, 20, five mils of water and analyzes those. And 20 minutes later, it, it does the same thing. And whoops, what you get back not sure. Yeah. What you get back uh, is shown in this dashboard down here, which are images, very you know, high resolution images of the particles that contain chlorophyll. The big ones on the left and the smaller ones as you get go down to the lower right. And you can see in this particular image, both Alexandrium and some, some diatoms that, that might well be Pseudonychia over here. And we use uh, sort of uh, machine learning technology to help us deal with the incredible number of images that come in. This is hundreds of thousands of, of images in a day. So. Uh, a huge amount of, uh, of data, and then we use the, um, we teach the instrument how to identify species. All right, results. This is the uh, data, these are the data showing the cyst abundance from Healy 1801. You can see starting down here in Nome, and the color over here is the cysts per cubic centimeter. So you can see that down here in Nome, the, as you closer to shore, it's relatively low, a um, little bit higher out towards the, the, uh, the western side of that, those transects. And then as you move up um, and you get near this, this area, um, you can see these circles all turning red and they're now getting into to, to levels that we see routinely out here in the Gulf of Maine in areas that, that we have recurrent uh, Alexandrian blooms. And notice in that same area that the Japanese found a very high abundance of, of Alexandrium cysts, uh, would have been five years ago, we found a very similar number, 11,000 cysts per cubic centimeter right there, and quite high abundance along that. that a bit less abundant, a little bit less abundant further, and then as you get near to the, the flow into the, the Beaufort, Again, the cysts are there in, in hundreds to maybe a thousand or more uh, cysts per, per cubic centimeter. So um, the, the, this was entirely successful 
uh, sampling effort. We've got a very nice picture <laughs> of the cyst abundance that goes far beyond what the, what the Japanese have published. And as I said, the next cruise will uh, double sample some of these sites, which will be important for us to see how reproducible the results are, but then extend it further to the east. Um, I th we just uh, got this data handed to me today, and it's very interesting. Um, you can see over here in the upper right these lines, DBO3, the Ledyard Bay Icy Cape, and uh, the DBO5. The red bars are showing the cysts per cubic centimeter that you just saw at those little those circles. The blue line is the bottom temperature um, measured uh, by Bob Picard and, and others on the, on the cruise. And you can, in my looking at this, uh, I'm seeing a number of things. And let's focus right now just on the temperature. Notice in DBO3 that the water right near the shore there is as much as eight degrees, eight, seven, six degrees in this interval, then dropping down to about four degrees uh, across the rest of that transect. The same thing for Ledyard Bay, even higher, up to nine degrees and then dropping down very cold as you go further offshore. But then look at Icy Cape and DBO5, and you can see these temperatures are down near zero, maybe one degree, and, and maybe two degrees over here. The reason this is important is that at these really cold temperatures, like zero or one degrees, Alexandrium cysts take a long time to germinate. They can germinate at those temperatures, but they can actually take months to do that. Whereas at five, six, seven degrees, they can germinate in much shorter time, in, in a week or two, maybe even less. And so um, one of our concerns all along when we started these, this project was, how do you get this big cyst seed bed up here in the Chukchi? And one of our thoughts was that it was um, the result of blooms that started down here in the Bering, uh, the Bering Sea and then were transported up and dropped cysts in this region as those blooms terminated, but that the waters may have been too cold for those cysts to germinate, and maybe it was such a high abundance because they were getting deposited there year after year, but not having any losses due to germination. Now it's starting to look like germination is entirely possible up there, and that you could have local or in situ development of blooms. So that's, that's what we are looking at and with the additional cruises that I'll tell you about, uh, we hope to be able to address that. Um, in terms of the, the, the abundance of vegetative cells, they were definitely in the water. Um, the, you can see up here that the auto, auto classification of the IFCB images, I don't know why that does that. Let's move ahead. Oops. Um, that, that we've done the, uh, made the, mach the machine-based classifiers for the species we're interested in, and that's, we are now uh, manually curating all the data. Um, we did take water samples for that fluorescent in situ hybridization analysis. They are still on the ship, and we're gonna have, have them back after Healy 1803. This was a, an issue having to do with shipping uh, hazardous waste. These are all in methanol, and they were, I won't go into it, but it was, uh, we weren't actually able to, to take them with us and, or, or ship them, so they're on the boat. But the IFCB does still tell us a great deal. If you look at these different um, dashboards down the bottom, you can see a sort of a, a gradient in the abundance of uh, Alexandrium cells, these, these dark brown circles, as you move from Nome over towards uh, rats. Mm -hmm. Hold on. I think my trackpad is doing more things than I want it to right now. So let's go back to this one. Okay, I'm using my trackpad as a mouse and it thinks I'm doing more. So um, as you're taking then samples, this first one is DBO3, the first dashboard. You can see that there are relatively low concentration of Alexandrian cells on the order of zero to 200 cells per liter um, increasing at the offshore station, maybe to about a thousand cells per liter out there. Um, as you move then further to the east, to the, um, this icy cape line, and you can see this red uh, star there. Uh, there we were seeing on the order of 5,000 cells per liter. And I should say that in the Gulf of Maine, 
concentrations of, of even a thousand cells per liter are more than enough to get the shellfish uh, dangerously toxic and cause closures. Um, so when we're up at 5,000 cells per liter, we're actually seeing a, a reasonable bloom up there. Um, we also saw cells around 2,000 cells per liter on that Ledyard line. But then as you go further to the east, uh, to that blue, uh, blue star, cells, Alexander cells were present, but at much lower levels and in a number of stations, not even evident. On Pseudonychia species, we only have preliminary IFCB data, and even that's going to be limited because you cannot distinguish toxic from non-toxic forms and even can't distinguish among many of the Pseudonychia species uh, using these types of images. Even under the microscope, you, you can't do it. Um, so uh, we will get some qualitative Pseudonychia data from the IFCB, but what we are planning and the samples will be processed after 1803 is this ARISA method that Kate Hubbard does, which, which basically, uh, this is an example of how we've used it uh, here in the Northeast. It, it's a way to get the relative abundance of a variety of uh, Pseudonychia species. And you can see in the Northeast that on these different uh, stations, if you will, along the coast, that this, these pie diagrams on the right show very different Pseudonychia species composition. And th this was done when the whole area from uh, A to B was pretty well closed because of domoic acid uh, and the amnesiac shellfish poisoning threat. And, and so you can see that uh, the big blue area here is Pseudonychia, I'm sorry, is this red area is Pseudonychia australis, which was extremely abundant in this ABC region and not at all abundant down further to the south, and that is the most toxic pseudonychia we have in our region. So that is the kind of analysis we will be doing on 1803 and 1801 uh, pseudonychia samples. So to finish up then, our future plans, um, we have been, glad to report, we have been funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, polar programs for a project uh, that you see here, origin and fate of HABs in the warming Chukchi Sea. Bob Picard is the co-PI. We're going to be looking at a real strong combination of biology and physics in that, in that study. Uh, so next year, we will be having a cruise um, up, as you see here, these are the black circles then are the stations very dense station because it's a good bit of physical oceanography going on, but we will also be doing um, additional sediment sampling, a lot of plankton sampling, and a number of other studies as well. So there will be another Healy cruise sometime next summer, hopefully during the Alexandrium uh, bloom season, uh, to follow up on what I've shown you. So that's, that's all I have there, Emily. Thank you so much, Don. Um, do we have any questions on the line for Don before we move on? Uh, this is Jeff in Seattle. I have a question. Hey, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, Don, uh, what's the sedimentation rate there, and, and are these cells getting buried uh, rapidly into the sediment, or, or how much turnover is there? Were you able to do any cores as well as the surface sediment sampling? Actually, I think Jackie might be much better off at answering that sedimentation rate question, but to me, that, that would not be what would be burying these cysts. It's, it's really a bioturbation uh, issue in, in every other place we've looked. And these cysts um, will stay on the surface for a period of time, but they, they will get buried. But also sometimes that burial can work the other way with whether they're feeding with heads up or heads down. So there, there will always be some cysts in the surface sediments, which is where we think the germination will uh, will come from. But, but one of the studies that we're actually planning in the, uh, this NSF project is going to try to look at the vertical distribution of these cysts and even to try to get at, at their ages and how long have these, uh, has this species been up there. Thank you. Don, I have a quick question for you. So when you were showing some of your um, IFCB results from the icy cape line specifically, where you saw concentrations of 5,000 cells per liter, 
And you were talking about how at that concentration that would be considered a bloom. Can you talk about, was there any sort of like toxicity tests that you were able to conduct while you were up there to see if these Alexandrium cells were actually producing toxins or? Well, on this, on this cruise, um, we didn't. Uh, well, there's samples that have been collected that'll be for demoic acid uh, toxin analysis, but, uh, but for Alexandrium, no. But we, um, what, we, what we are doing is establishing cultures to, to look at the, at the toxicity of these isolates, and, and uh, there's a, actually quite a bit of information there. But uh, no, and, and in this case, I, to me, there would have been no doubt um, in, in terms of the, there are, um, it, it, well, I, I guess I should qualify that by saying once we do the fish analysis, then there would be little doubt that if this, uh, if, if our probes hybridize to these cells as we expect they, they will, then these cells are definitely toxic. They are, there as yet there is no, uh, we have, that probe does not cross-react with any non-toxic Alexandrium uh, species. So, uh, yeah. All right, any other quick questions for Dom? Well, thank you so much, Don, for that overview. Lots of really interesting information there. Um, so we'll move on next. Um, I have on the agenda an update from Kristen Cecil and Lisa Eisner, who are both on the line today. If the two of you want to talk about some of the samples you collected um, for this project and some of your general observations throughout um, the region this season, that would be great. Okay, um, so the, this is Kristen. Uh, the survey started the 25th and just ended on the 19th. We covered uh, from 60 north to 65.5 and from shore to about 170 west. Uh, for the HAB specific sampling, we uh, took 10 coastal water samples uh, with the kit that was provided to us by Emily. Uh, we did 22 ASP and PSP uh, presence absence test kits, all came back negative. And then we took um, herring and pollock samples for uh, demoic acid uh, presence from our entire grid. So our, um, and that was, those were all special requests. We do some um, standardized sampling, which is a CTD, a bongo, and a fish trawl at every station, and they're about 30 nautical miles apart. So for the HAB specific sampling, um, it went, I think, pretty well. It was a little rough in the beginning, and we could have used a little bit more direction uh, for where to target, because only having 10 sample jars, we weren't sure if you guys wanted like northern coastal or south, so we just kind of spread it around. But yeah, I think it was it was very easy to deploy and only took like three minutes. Great, good feedback. Yeah, we just were so last minute getting that to you guys. So I'm glad that you were able to receive it and collect those samples. And you sent those to Beaufort, correct? We haven't, we don't have an address to send them to. That was my other thing. So we're just sitting on them right now. I will follow up with you and we will be okay. sending those to the Beaufort Laboratory. Okay. Okay. I will send you an email after this call. That would be great. Um, yeah, in the future, we're happy to do that. And it was very easy to accommodate the um, additional water sampling. We just need a little bit more direction and um, yeah. Yeah, on where to actually collect them. Yes, definitely. Yeah, or where the interest is. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, so the lowest bottom temperature we saw in our entire surface and in the northern part of our grid it was only 3.8 degrees and that was at like 64.5 north 169 west so it was pretty for us it was pretty warm up there mm -hmm. all right thank you so much any other interesting observations um we did go into the chukchi and saw a massive amount of fin whales we actually had to abort in a abort a station because of the number of fin whales. Wow. 
that's it for observations for that survey. Lisa might, if, does she, I don't know if she has anything to add. This, this is Don Anderson. I have a, just a question. I may have missed this in the beginning. When was this cruise? August 25th through September 19th. And you were giving a lot of coordinates and I don't have that, have it handy. Can you put in names of where it went from and where it ended? So like Nunavak to up into the Strait. And we spent a little bit time outside of our normal grid and went to the Chukchi, but that was additional, that was at the tail end of it. And Does Kristen, that help? And Kristen, I'll get um, the coordinates for the 10 water samples you were able to collect with us and, and Don, I'm happy to share those coordinates with you. So yeah, you can I have map. all the, that, we sampled those at our specific stations. We have a gridded station uh, map and they're all 30 nautical miles apart. Perfect. Yeah, that will be very useful to get the information about where they were and, uh, and especially once the results are back from, from no Beaufort. One of the things we're trying to do is schedule this cruise next year um, where we really want to have, a, have blooms in the water and it's still not obvious to me exactly what time of the year we should be targeting because here you're saying in the end of August and early September you're seeing no Alexandrium cells down in the strait and then basically a short time after that we are seeing them right? you know i that was the first time we've used those presence absence dipstick test kits so i don't know we had they're not easy to use the interpretation of the results seem a little subjective Okay, so that's right. You're just saying you didn't see any toxin with those kits. Right. It just, it's, yeah, you like filtered a massive amount of water and then you take from that and test it. And we just did surface samples for that. And, and how much water did you filter for the samples that are to be sent to Beaufort? Uh, we did a, we were provided with a, like, we called it a baby bongo net and um, towed it for three minutes on the side of the boat. Okay. At so the surface. It'll be a plankton net tow, so it really won't be quantitative, but it will at least know where the cells are. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you. And You're Kristen, welcome. just one other quick question. You were talking about, I was taking notes and I think I missed it. Um, after you were talking about your dipstick samples, you mentioned something about pollock testing. Can you talk about that? Um, we got a request from the Northwest Fishery Science Center and they are they asked us for herring and pollock from our entire survey grid to do uh, demoic acid. They said toxic algal uh, testing. Okay. So, and in the past, she's done demoic acid testing on our salmon, but this was specifically for herring and pollock. And who is that 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 request came from? Uh, one second. I believe it's Kathy. The fever? Yes. Yep. OK. And she Spencer Shoalwater from UW. And Kathy might be on the line. She said she was going to call in, but I'll follow up with her about that. Okay, thank you Kristen, so much. This is, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Jump in. How far north did you go into the Chukchi, relatively speaking? 67 north, just uh, north of Cotsview. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Kristen. Lisa, did you have any, I think you're on the line. Do you want to jump in and say anything before we move on? Well, Kristen and Lisa, thank you so much for working with us and collecting those extra samples. Like I said, you were the first um, guinea pigs to receive um, that bucket of sampling materials and I really appreciate you doing that. And in the future, we'll be much more organized with trying to get a better idea of where to collect on your grid. But I think that getting those samples along the coast, um, space 30 miles apart, should give us a nice kind of baseline idea about what was going on at that time. So thank you again so much. And I will follow up with you after um, this call to get you some information on getting those samples to Beaufort, which turns around okay. the tables quite quickly. So we should get some results back pretty soon, I think. Wonderful. Hey, Emily, it's Chris Holdreed. I just had a quick question. Hey, Chris. 
Hey, for the uh, fish testing, is it possible that they're doing saxitoxin as well? Kristen, do you know? Or Lisa? She was very, I'm looking at her sample request, and it just said samples from the study would be used for a spatial analysis of taxon, taxon presence in fish, fin fish in the Bering Sea. She does not specifically say what she's doing. Okay, hopefully it's both. That would be that would be really cool to see. Thanks. Okay, um, let's move on to our next check-in. So I have Jeff Knapp on the agenda, who went out in September with a Northern Bering Sea Fisheries Trawl Survey and also collected some samples for us as well. So Jeff, are you still on the line? I still am. Hi, Jeff. Hello. Uh, actually, I didn't go out. I'm just going to report for the folks that were out there. I was out in the Aleutian Islands this summer instead. Okay. Uh, this is one of our uh, ground fish and crab surveys. Um, last year, uh, we did a survey up in the northern Bering Sea, and we had intended to do these every other year. Uh, but because of the unprecedented conditions up there, we got a quick uh, survey off that was very similar in aerial coverage to the one that uh, Chris Cecil just described, uh, basically from Nunavak and St. Matt's Island up to the Bering Strait. Uh, we didn't get up into the Chukchi. Uh, like Chris, we saw very warm temperatures. Uh, we're accustomed to finding a cold pool in that area and in some years even further down into the Bering Sea, but this year we did, uh, found very few stations with water below two degrees. Uh, it was also a 30 mile grid uh, with a, a station in the middle where we did bottom trawling, but we also had the benefit of receiving one of the kits that you supplied and uh, filtered seawater. And I believe, I can't remember, did those samples go to Kachemak Bay or did they go to Beaufort? One of the two for we Alexandrium. Went to Beaufort. Okay, went to Beaufort. And I think what I heard was they found very low abundances. Correct. Uh, these are all water samples that were filtered. Uh, we did not, I don't believe we saved any fish tissue samples. Um, and the uh, survey was the 9th to the 20th of August. Uh, we will be back again next year to do the survey, but on a, a smaller grid size, I believe 20 nautical miles instead of 30. And next year we'll be sampling more closer to shore than we did this year. We just had to, uh, we only had a bit, a little bit of time uh, to do the survey this year. So we could repeat some sampling next year and, and save fish tissue or uh, tissue from invertebrates if people uh, want to put in uh, some special sample requests. Uh, the other thing that Ebet Sidden mentioned is that a lot of the data from the Alaska Center is going to go into this ecosystems considerations chapter uh, that will be presented to the, uh, to the Fisheries Council. And uh, so if people would like to see summaries of uh, at least what uh, some of the NIMS folks and maybe bet or there are some other people that report to you like U.S. Fish and Wildlife too with the bird, seabird die-offs, is that also in the report? Not sure if he bet's still there, but but uh, that that report can be made available to to other researchers so they can see what general uh, conditions people found at different times of the year in the northern Bering and the uh, northern and southern Bering. And that's all I have. Great, thank you so much, Jeff. And that's really good to know that you guys will be doing the survey next year in an even tighter grid and closer to shore. And we will definitely um, keep that in mind and hopefully send some more sample kits with you and get people in touch that might be interested in collecting some tissue samples, like you said. So thank you for that. Okay, I'll try to. There's a particular schedule that we sort of accept the requests and review requests for additional sampling. So I'll get you the contact person and the uh, schedule for that so that if people are interested, they can get the request in. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Jeff? Okay, hearing none, we will move on um, to an update from Steve Kipler at the Beaufort Laboratory who has been analyzing some of these samples that um, we've been collecting as a part of this project. So Steve? Thanks a lot. Um, first, I wanna apologize that I did not send any slides. Um, 
We're still recovering from Hurricane Florence here, and unfortunately, our network, computer network, and internet and phones are all still down. So we're we're struggling a little bit. But I put a summary, um, a series of summary data together for you. So from um, this August on the Alaska night, um, we received ten samples, and um, as um, I think Jeff pointed out, um, he heard correctly that there was very low abundance. We got between zero and um, way less than one cell per liter, um, 0 0.04 cells per liter to be exact. Um, in the region stretching from north of St. Lawrence Island um, down further to not quite um, the Bristol Bay, but um, that those low abundances, although it's feasible to detect them with quantitative PCR that we're using, um, they really um, qualify as detectable but not really quantifiable. Um, when it's that low. So in a sense, it's good news that there was low abundances there, but it also um, is an interesting indication of the distribution of alexandrium cells in the area, because if Don was seeing very high abundances up into um, the Chukchi and Beaufort, similar to previous years, um, but very low abundance down in, in the, um, the Bering Sea. So that, that's an interesting pattern. I'd be curious to see if that um, follows in, in future years. Now, just to put some of these numbers or lack of numbers in comparison, um, we got some samples from the fair weather back in July of 2015 um, from about the same area in the Bering Sea around St. Lawrence Island again. And there we got between zero and 500 cells per liter of alexandrium. Um, and if you compare that to published um, data, Nat Suiki et al. in their 2017 paper um, found about 3,600 cells per liter in a similar part of um, Alaska. So there's definitely some ups and downs in terms of abundance from year to year. Um, and then in comparison to the rest of the state, um, in Ketchumak Bay and Lower Cook Inlet, um, typically we see a single bloom each year of, of up to about 3,000 cells per liter. Um, and that was during the warming period say 2012 to 2016, when the North Pacific warming um, anomaly was going on or the blob. More recently, um, some data from 2017, um, we found a maximum abundance of only 126 cells per liter. So there was definitely a, a downturn. <clears throat> and Chris, um, for your information, I haven't gotten back to you yet on this, but from 2018, we found a similar pattern, a uh, maximum of only 130 cells per liter in Kachemek Bay as well. Um, so there seems to be a, a dip in alexandrum abundance in the southern portions of Alaska. Um, I don't know if that's universal, but it is, it is interesting. And then just to throw a few other comparison numbers in um, from Kodiak, where you see some of the highest toxicities due to uh, alexandrian blooms in Alaska. <clears throat> Julie Matwiu reported back in 2001, she got about 800 to 1100 cells per liter. So that gives you a little bit of a range. Um, and I know Liz Tobin reported some numbers back at AMSS back in January of 2017, um, but it was a presentation and I, I didn't have any of the actual data to go along with that. Um, but maybe someone on the, on the line saw the same presentation will remember. So I think um, we learned a couple of things um, just from this little snapshot of Alexandrium. Um, we're sort of used to seeing higher abundances, um, uh, much like it occurs in other parts of the Pacific Northwest. But our, our dogma that we've been proceeding along with um, is that higher temperatures generally produce higher alexandrum abundance. Um, and I'm not saying that these data disprove that. I'm just saying that th there does seem to be um, some interesting disparity between the water temperatures that we might see in the Bering Sea, um, which were between about 5 and 11 degrees. Um, and Alexander abundance being so low, whereas in other places we, we got a really nice linear relationship. But that just goes to show um, the more you ask questions, the, <laughs> the more questions you typically generate. Um, I think that's probably about all I can produce right now without having access to some of these files. Um, and it, and it, I know that some of the folks that collected samples and are planning to send them to us or have already done so, um, have indicated that there's been a little bit of communication um, problem with getting uh, protocols together and figuring out what they needed to do. Um, so I think this is, uh, there's a lot of lessons to be learned here, um, certainly on our end as well. Um, 
have most of the time we don't know the samples are even coming or who collected them. So I think we'll definitely be able to uh, improve on the communication chain in future years. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much for that update, Steve. I agree, many lessons to learn from this season and it sounds like you've got some more samples coming your way. So I will be in touch with you so you're prepared to receive those. Great. Um, but thanks for that overview. Yeah, it is really interesting that it seems that what's emerging from this call is that we're actually seeing low cell abundances in the south, whereas up in the Chukchi where Don was, we're seeing some pretty high concentration. So interesting trend emerging there. Um, any questions for Steve? Okay, Steve, thanks for calling in. I'm glad that everything's okay down there in Beaufort. So we're getting a little bit of feed. Okay, yeah. Emily, this is this is Don. Uh, I have no idea why, but uh, the whole system blanked out when Steve started to talk. We tried calling in on telephone. I didn't hear anything, and it's 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 important. So should I talk to? Steve, separately, or can I ask for a quick summary? We are actually recording this meeting, so I can give you a recording of the meeting. He had a nice um, overview, and I can connect you two after the call if that's okay. Okay, no, I can say it again. I think the high-level overview is that we're not seeing, in 2018, we're not seeing very high Alexandrium, well, if anything, um, concentrations um, in, the, in the southern region, in the Bering, and then compared to the observations that you made further north, um, there's an interesting dynamic that's emerging. It doesn't seem like maybe temperature is the only control, but if well, Chris or um, Steve or someone wants to jump in and Steve putting you on the spot again. Oh, no problem. Um, Don, I'll, I'll be on the um, the CIS cruise, um, I guess next week really, with Bruce. Um, so if you like, I can, I can pass things through Bruce to you or, or just send me an email. No big deal. Where's that leaving from? Actually, I should know, but uh, is that that's not leaving? Oh, the, in, in the Gulf of Maine. That's going out of Providence. Going out of Providence. Okay, so I can't see. Okay, well, I'll I'll watch this recording, and if I have questions again, I'm just what we're trying to do is figure out when when we can schedule this big cruise. We have sort of one shot at scheduling this, um, and we want to maximize the opportunity of really getting. A bloom so uh, but what it seems like what we're seeing so far is that things were much more abundant up in the in the Chuck Chi than they were down in the, the Bering Sea which is very interesting this is this is gay would this the high abundance in the Chuck Chi be more a reflection of water mass movement well see our, our our hypothesis that we've put in the proposal and been thinking of for a long time is that there's there's two possibilities. You know, one is that you've got this uh, transport of blooms from the, the south, uh, Bering Sea, Bering Strait area, whatever, that, that go up into the Chukchi. And because it's colder there, they don't necessarily grow as well. And that, it, that it's the problems delivered there. That's, that's what we have here in much of New England. The problems originate up towards Canada and eastern Maine and then travel hundreds of kilometers to affect states to the south. So that that's a common way for, for us to, to view some of these blooms. But the other alternative is that there's local germination, local growth, and the water temperatures I showed you start to suggest that's possible uh, near shore. Um, we'll, uh, you know, so that's why it's so important if we can get a good snapshot of, of, of the whole pathway. Um, and some part of it has a bloom in it, we'll, we'll have some good information next year. I've got, a, I've got a quick question. This is Will Ambrose. Is it possible you could get a combination of those two? Given the lower temperatures and the transport, could you just get a bloom that develops later downstream than you might see in the Gulf of Maine? Well, that's, I think that's what Emily was getting at about there being no temperature uh, interaction here because I would presume it's warmer in the, in the Bering Sea than it is up in the, in the Chukchi. So it was sort of going backwards. That's where you'd think that you'd have cells growing well to the south and growing more poorly in the, the north. And that's, that's what we have 
in the Gulf of Maine, where our, our blooms tend to start down in, in the western Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts area, and then they, they shift to the east towards eastern Maine and Canada as those waters warm. Yeah, and Don, this is Chris. I think one of the things that you were showing from um, your slides on the onshore offshore bit, you know, we have that big temperature gradient onshore offshore, so that that adds an additional wrinkle. Exactly, and that's that's why Bob Picard's so interested in the Alaskan coastal current in in this NSF project because that is the a good source of warm water, and and I think now we've got interest both in the surface and the bottom temperatures of that of that feature. So, and Don, is something else that you're going to be doing, will you be taking the cysts that you found in the sediment and culturing them and re-germinating them? Is that something you're planning on doing? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, uh, there's a variety of reasons for doing that. One of them is to uh, look at this connectivity that I was talking about. That, that would be with this microsatellite analysis where you try to really look at fine scale uh, differences between populations to see if they really are related. But we're also going to be establishing many, many cultures across that whole pathway all the way over to the Beaufort and doing toxin composition analysis, which is um, basically there's uh, more than 20 different saxitoxin and different strains produce different suites of those toxins and it, it can become a fingerprint of sorts. And there's a few of those published by the Japanese and we've published some for the coast of Russia, but uh, that will actually start to tell us a lot about pathways of introduction and how heterogeneous the populations are and maybe how related they are as well. So that's another thing we'll do with those, uh, those isolates. But then we also have some growth experiments planned with some from different areas to, to see just again, how they respond to temperature and, and a few other simple parameters. All right, <clears throat> moving on. It looks like the next thing on the agenda is Chris Holderied, who is going to give a Catchmack Bay update. Chris? Hey, thanks, Emily. So um, I'll add actually to some of the things that Steve said because he covered the numbers. So the interesting thing for us is to date um, in the Bay. We're not seeing the um, sort of September Alexandrian bloom that we've kind of late August, early September. Um, instead, we got a late bloom of diatoms. So different diatoms than earlier in the season, um, but just a different, uh, different mix. And um, one of the interesting things, both in 2017 and 2018, relative to the uh, three previous years where we saw um, quite a bit of a bloom, is that it's, we're back to normal temperatures. So Gulf of Alaska, we saw the um, Pacific Marine heat wave, 2014 to 2016. And for us, um, what happened in Ketchmack Bay was what we had PSP events from the from Alexandrium and Saxitoxin that we had not seen in over a decade before that. Um, but we'd also had a you know stretch of cold, cooler than normal temperatures. So there's a fair amount of we've had we had. Um, uh, multiple years of sampling and taking environmental conditions. And as Steve Kibler mentioned earlier, one of the things that we showed here was a pretty tight correlation between temperature and the Alexandrian blooms with a threshold around 8C, um, 8 degrees Celsius, which you know, at least in this area. Um, and I think one of the interesting things, but we're also not not highly nutrient limited. So I think that that combination that was kind of being talked earlier with so you know, between different regions, what are the environmental controls? And then I think also what's happening with the rest of the plankton community might be something taking a look at, at least for maybe areas further south, perhaps up north as well. Um, I think there's, there's going to be some really interesting um, work there that will help us explain kind of what's happening in different regions. Um, what I'm excited about is um, both in this forum and with the Alaska HAB network is that we're kind of talking um, through the work that's being done in the different regions. So I really appreciate, Emily, your effort in, in organizing all of this. Um, the only other thing I think I wanted to mention was that um, we are starting a project, um, uh, and North Pacific Research Board funded project looking at paralytic shellfish toxins. Um, it's actually uh, Zhejiang Du out of the Hatfield Marine Science Center. It's the lead, um, also working with Rob Campbell over in the 
Prince William Sound Science Center, um, looking at the toxins in forage fish and predator fish. So we did that that formally that project starts this um, uh, next month, but we did some preliminary. Dominic Condolero, who's on the line, uh, and Steve Kibler did some preliminary sampling for that this summer. So. No, I would be based on the uh, both the the water test and toxin test we have from um, muscle and clam tissue, which are all low. I wouldn't expect to see a lot, but at least we'll be taking a look. So that's the main thing to add. Thank you so much, Chris. Any questions for Chris? Okay. Um, and then moving on to our last update is from Sea Tour. So, Kari Lanfer, are you still? On? I see you. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie. I work with the Sika Tribe of Alaska. Um, I'm representing the Sea Tour Network today as well. That's Southeast Alaska Tribal Ocean Research. Um, for those who don't know, we're a group of tribal governments spread throughout primarily Southeast that are doing some plankton. Um, and shellfish monitoring for marine biotoxins like PSP and demoic acid as well. I wanted to speak a little bit about what we have seen uh, this past summer here in Southeast. In um, this summer, we've had a lot of uh, community involvement in our plankton bloom. Um, we've got our phones ringing all the time, people emailing us about all kinds of different colors and the different plankton blooms they're seeing in their area. Um, we have had folks, especially down in the southern southeast area, such as Metlakatla and Ketchikan, who have seen orange, red blooms. And, you know, we see this wave of information on Facebook that's, you know, red tide, red tide. Um, we've been lucky enough that we've had folks in that area who have gone out and done that plankton net toe. We've been able to look at it and it, see that it, it was an alexandrium. You know, in this case, it was Noctiluca. So that was cool that we've had, you know, folks on the ground who've been able to kind of sequester some of the general fears when they see anything red in the water. Um, in southern southeast this year, in Ketchikan, um, it's been a lot quieter than it was in 2017. 2017, we recorded PSP levels in some of their shellfish to be over 3,000 micrograms of toxins per 100 grams of shellfish tissue. This year, they did have their first hot blue mussel sample over the FDA regulatory limit um, in April, and they've stayed above that 80, but their peak was about 217 compared to 3,000 in the previous year. So Ketchikan did go over that FDA regulatory limit, but it didn't climb nearly as high. Um, in that southern and southeast area as well, um, Petersburg seems to always be quiet almost every single a uh, test that we do for them is very, very low, um, essentially NTB. Looking at the Prince of Wales area in Southeast, that is Craig, Heidelberg, Kassan, and Cloak. Um, we haven't had any of our sentinel species blue mussels um, go above the FDA regulatory limit or very high above the FDA regulatory limit of 80, um, but we have seen uh, consistently hot butter clams from those areas. Um, you know, likely um, from previous blooms in previous years, they're still holding on to those toxins. Um, in northern southeast, um, it's about the same story where we haven't seen too many samples of our sentinel species going above, but uh, in cake, it's kind of the exception. Cake has had um, a really big bloom that started in July and has continued so far through August. Um, and likely into September. So their highest sample was um, just over 1,500, which in the previous years that we've looked at cake in 2016 and 2017, we didn't see values anywhere near that high. So if there was, you know, something going on in that uh, cake area that really changed the dynamics of what's happening there. In general, in 2017, we had um, a lot more communities that had beaches that recorded shellfish um, that were over that FDA regulatory limit than we did in 2018. And the peaks um, occurred a little bit earlier. They occurred in May and early June um, compared to 2018. Um, we had a small spike in early April or in late April, excuse me, in places like Ketchikan. And then in Skagway, there was a small spike um, in early May as well. 
but the primary samples that we saw go really high this year it didn't happen until um, late July or early August. So things seem to be a little bit delayed um, in 2018 compared to 2017. And then in general, I'm not sure what weather has been like in other places in Alaska this summer, but here in Southeast, it has been an unprecedented uh, summer. It's been really sunny, really warm. Um, I think in many communities this September, it's the driest September in you know well over 50 years. Here in Sitka, really the first time we got rain was Saturday, almost in all of September. So it has been um, a little bit different of a season for sure. Carrie, thank you so much for that update. So much information. I might actually touch base with you after the call just to make sure that I got everything down. I was taking notes um, during that. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm really glad that we could get an update from you guys. Yeah, and then um, Emily, right after this call, I do actually have to jump into the lab and um, run RBA. Um, so a little bit later this afternoon would work a little better for me. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right, so any questions for any of the speakers or um, anyone else on the line that isn't necessarily on the agenda that wants to um, contribute anything is welcome to um, hop in. Hey, Emily, it's Chris. I'll just um, add that we saw the similar later um, diatom, diatom blooms here in Kachemak Bay. So there's, there's a sense that things in the water were just a little bit later than they were last year. That's similar to what Carrie was seeing. Yeah. And we we enjoyed that same beautiful sunshine. We were kind of keeping an eye out for what it would mean. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Emily. This is uh, Doug Causey up in Anchorage. Hey, Doug. So uh, uh, this summer, it was in J July, we're doing um, – intensive co collecting of um, birds up in the northern Bering Sea in between St. Lawrence and St. Matthew Island. And we observed um, a lot of really emaciated or even dead birds floating on the water. The, 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 the projects we're doing are focused primarily on looking at the presence of plastics. Um, so, um, we have a lot of birds sampled from, from this area, both the, the, that appeared to be healthy and those that were clearly not healthy as, as dead. So um, when, well, one of the things that we're very interested in looking at is, is to see um, uh, whether there is a presence of halves in these birds. And uh, uh, it's, it's hard to see what the association might be between that and the plastics. But that is something that we are very interested in looking at. Can I jump in? This is Gay Sheffield. Of course. Um, thank you, and, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't catch the speaker's name. It's Doug Causey. Doug Causey. Um, hopefully, thank you for your report that the Bering Strait region has been having a seabird die-off two years in a row, but this year was of longer duration of more species and um, species have been sent, samples have been sent, carcasses have been sent to the National Wildlife Health Center and uh, I know they've had about 25 birds from this region, multi-species. Is that of, of interest to you? They're being tested for harmful algal blooms and, and um, toxins as the results have started to come back. It's, it's really starvation that's gotten these birds. Um, are you working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on these, on this issue? Because they probably, if you're yes. not, maybe you're with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I don't know. No, I'm at the university, uh, UAA here. And mm -hmm. yes, the, we are working with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the, the, they're emaciated, but did not appear to be because of lack of food, because like I said, that there were birds also that, that were, just, were healthy and normal. So we're not really sure what's going on. Correct, thank you. So Doug, are you looking to maybe send samples somewhere to have the birds that you've already tested for the microplastics works that you were doing for HABs? 
we so so we're just starting that that uh, work. It, the uh, um, necropsies take <laughs> take a long time, but yeah. but 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 our we can subsample t t tissues very easily. And and I have reached out to to the wildlife um, disease lab, but um, um, as we start to do this this work, um, I do want to make sure that we're taking samples that can be used. Well, I would definitely like to keep in touch with you about what the results are from from that work that you're doing. Excellent. Okay. Anyone else on the line? Can I just, this is Elizabeth Sidden and Juno. Doug, where were your, sorry, I missed where your seabird samples were from that you said did not have evidence of starvation? Um, okay, so so we collected specimens in um, all the way out in Attu, um, St. Matthew, Hall Island, and then north of Hall Island. And in all three of those places were birds that were extremely emaciated and birds that were not. So um, there was no local area that that, that was distinguished. Um, we're still trying to figure out what what the patterns are. You know. Was it um, younger birds, older birds? That we don't know. And, it, okay. and within the same species, you see? Yes, yes. OK. Yes, and, and uh, for, for the sampling we're doing, we collected all species. This is okay. Okay. And within eight I species, you, you would see some healthy and some starving. I'm sorry, one? I was just trying to clarify if within a given species that you sampled, you saw both evidence of starvation and evidence of healthy feeding. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. you oh, this and, is uh, I thought you said you north of St. Lawrence Island. Is that correct? Or no, 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 no. North of uh, St. Matthew Island. Aha, uh -huh. okay, thank you, sorry. Hey, Emily, if there's interest, I, uh, we're, we're putting together a trip report right now on the, on the uh, places we went and the, and the birds we collected. I can make that available to, to anyone who's interested. Again, we're just starting the necropsy work, so I don't have much results on our work. Sure. Yeah, Doug, that would be great. And then also, like I mentioned, we want to have another call like this at the end of the season, so sometime mid to late November. So I would love to put you on the agenda to give an update during that call, too, if you think that would be of interest. I think so, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other updates from the group? Hey, Emily, it's Chris Holderreed again. Um, the seabird thing reminded me oddly to um, something I hadn't mentioned what's about pseudo -Nichia. So we are this year again seeing in September the pseudo -Nichia bloom and, and to the extent that it's it's um, dominant in some of the, the mid-month samples that the uh, Ketchmack Bay Research Reserve collects from community monitors. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally, I mean in the past this has always been, um, we've had pseudo -Nichia, but it's we've not seen um, anything above very low levels of toxicity. So that's just, I think it's going to be interesting to see what um, Don and company do with different um, species and kind of where we go with that link between the blooms and actual toxicity with tomoic acid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. Uh, th this is Don. Uh, a quick comment that our cruise and the Healy cruises uh, really start at Nome. But we, I know our collaborator on the Sudernitia work in terms of the ERISA analysis is <coughs> Kate Hubbard. And I know that she'd be happy and willing to run samples uh, for the Sudernitia community composition from other areas, not you know, huge, huge numbers. But I think further south um, would be of great interest. Um, these are, we'd have to send, maybe we could send it to you, Emily, or something, a protocol that the procedure it's not trivial to but but it's not that hard either to do the um, co the collection and the preservation of the sample so it can be run that way anyway it's it's something to think about to extend the data set further south than we're going to get with our own efforts 
So Don, for yeah. 1803, you're also going out of Nome? It's out of Dutch Harbor. Dutch. Okay, so it would kind of be interesting to see if you could get your um, IFCB set up and just getting data on your transit all the way from Dutch. I know it's in the end of October, November, so that's not really ideal for cells in the surface, but that might also be. Um, yeah, it, it's still on the on the boat and we'll be set up to uh, to do that in transit. Uh, it's it, that will not be a problem, and it might actually be the time of the year when you might find more more Sudernitia, even though it may be too late for Alexandria. Who knows? Yeah, Don, this is Chris. We would that would be great to be able to um, collaborate on that. I think that would matter a lot. You know, one of the questions that the state has is currently none of the um, commercial shellfish is tested for demoric acid, and because it hasn't been a, a risk, and so that'd be a you know, a big question to see if that's going to be changing at all. Okay, then people from uh, from here will get in touch with you and try to figure out a way of, of getting the sample not only uh, processed correctly, but then shipped. Um, they are shipped on dry ice, dry ice so it's not, again, it's <laughs> that's not never trivial. <laughs> never trivial, right, but, but we've done it lots of places, so uh, I'll have someone from from here get in touch with you, and, and we'll we'll add that to the samples. And and if there are others that are between you and Nome that you can think of, we we could take a few more. Sure. Yeah. I mean, right off the bat, I'd say Melissa, um, good at Dutch Harbor, the Sea Grant Map Extension Agent at Dutch Harbor. That'd be an interesting location. Great. Okay. Happy to help there. Thanks. This is uh, Carrie Lanfear with Sika Tribe. I just wanted to chime in and say that we also saw um, a couple different pseudonitra blooms, um, primarily here in Sika, but a little bit spread out in our other Southeast communities as well. And um, we did do some preliminary testing using Mercury Science ELISA kits. Um, and in, in most cases, we didn't find any demoic acid, but in a couple, we did find really low levels. And so in response to that, we purchased um, quite a few kits and, and so we're kind of, you know, ready when needed to do some testing, whether it's on uh, plankton samples or on shellfish samples, um, to just have an idea of, you know, is it in our water, is it in our food, um, a quick look. So we have that uh, in the fridge ready to go here in the Sickle Lab. And this is Donna. I'm just <laughs> going to say it's very prudent, I think, to do what you're, what you're doing in testing and, and just – if you don't see the Sudanich, I presume you never want to. It's going to be very different. Alexandrium seems to have patterns as to where it blooms and where it's transported to, and it's a lot more understandable. But Sudanich just uh, you know, doesn't have these benthic stages, and it's really at the whim of where the currents and, and where these populations are. We in the Here in the Northeast, we've had no issues with with the moic acid for decades. And then over the last several years, they've cropped up in, in uh, a number of occasions in quite serious levels. And um, I, I just think that's a matter of water masses that move in and carry a population that, that then flourishes. And that they could disappear just as fast as they, as they come. All right, with that, I think I'm gonna turn to the very last thing that we have on our agenda, um, which is just a quick overview of the research uh, workspace. So Chris is going to talk about that, but just as a quick introduction um, before she jumps in, um, through AUS AHAB, um, we've been creating a password protected uh, research workspace. It's not something that I've used before, which is why Chris is gonna hop in and talk about it. Um, but we're really trying to create a portal for all of the folks that are on the line today and that have been working with us previously to have um, one space where they could drop data and information into so that we can all share these observations, um, try to create a bigger picture because I think we're going to get the most um, a holistic point of view of what's going on by doing that. Um, so we just recently got that set up. It exists um, and we're going to be 
hopefully connecting you guys with the people at Axiom um, so that you can input any quantitative or qualitative information um, that you've been observing this season to really contribute to the synthesis. So with that, Chris, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, do you so let me know when you see my uh, screen show up. Okay. I'll see if it shows up. But while we're waiting for that, I'll just um, mention. So what? So I am the the third backup on this <laughs> this presentation because um, uh, Stacy Buckley with Axiom. Um, normally does this, or Darcy Dugan with uh, Alaska Ocean Observing System, and they are both were unable to be on the call today. So I'm going to talk about the, the research workspace mainly from a user perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and really for us, it's a great tool for kind of internal collaboration and, you know, to avoid um, um, too many emails back and forth and to have co collective places to put things, um, basically. So. Uh, what it and the way they have it set up, what, the way Axiom has it set up right now on the data side is that you can be working through your data steps um, with multiple people getting in there, processing and everything else. And then once you have a place where your final data is, you literally just click it to say, okay, this is the publishable data, and there's a link directly to the um, online data, public data portal where it comes up. So it's a really nice um, sort of, um, you know, soup to nuts way of, of handling information collectively with people spread over geographic areas. So I'm still not seeing your screen. Yeah, I don't see it coming up. Are you hitting Meredith, can you screen? jump into the, um, can you jump, uh, Meredith, um, Emily, can you jump into it? I've actually never been in it. You've never been in it? No. This was going to be my my debut. And if this doesn't work, we can defer to the next. Um, yeah, we could do it. We could maybe do it as a, a separate thing for folks who are interested. Um, okay. What I was going to show is that just one of the things you can do is set up. So we have for our um, Gulf Watch Alaska ecosystem monitoring program. You know, there's 15 different monitoring projects. We have one of them in Ketchmack Bay and Cook Inlet, and you know we have monthly um, CTD data that we're collecting and so we can manage it all on the on the workspace and anybody can take a look in there so we're looking at the data as it goes through processing steps and then the final data um, but what we also put up on there are things like hey I want the to look at the contours of temperature or salinity or fluorescence from from different surveys so you can put you know a set of figures up there mm -hmm. um, it's just a way to, to have a collaborative space but it also gives us that place in the same area to put, you know, basically one of the folders in there is final data for this year. Um, click, and then Axiom knows that that's what's going to be published on the public data portal. And then if there's any issues with it, it's pretty easy to um, manage that back and forth. So the, w the way it's organized is by what, what Axiom calls our campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the IARPIC collaboration will be a campaign mm -hmm. on there. And you can belong to, like, we all belong to multiple campaigns. But it's basically just a really nice um, collaboration space that lets you manage different types of data and information. Yeah, that sounds great. That seems like it would be really useful for this group. Um, so I, I hope that we can get that set up. And I will make sure that either Stacy or Darcy is available to give um, an overview at our next check-in in, in November so we can um, start sharing information there. So Chris, you're off the hook. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you everyone to calling in. Um, we got through everything in really good time. I think we had a really good conversation and have drawn some really interesting um, observations together today. Uh, so I'm going to work on writing up some notes, might follow up with a few of you um, on some details. We are recording this meeting, um, so I will post the meeting recording on the IARPIC website, um, as well as the meeting notes, and we'll email it out to the group as well. Uh, there are a couple of follow-up items I have, so I will follow up with some individuals after this call. But um, just really quickly, I want to open it up and make sure that 
nobody has any last minute comments or, or questions um, to throw out while we're, while we're together. Um, Emily, I will add one thing because uh, I just got an email from Elizabeth. Um, Kathy is is going to be for those fish fin fish samples. Yep. Going to be produ um, processing for both demoic acid and saxitoxin. That's great. Yes, that is great. I will follow up with Kathy and make sure that she's on our next call as well. And this is Kristen Cecil. Hey, Kristen. I just want to make sure that uh, everyone understood that we do that survey for the uh, North Bank Sea annually. This is the surface one, so we will be doing it in 2019. Great. Good to know. I will start making a calendar um, for 2019 without dates, but just kind of uh, different cruises that are going out that might be able to participate. It sounded like um, so Kristen, your group is going to have another cruise, and then it sounds like Jeff is also um, getting another cruise together for 2019, which is great. Okay, well, with that, thank you for everyone that called in. Special thank you to all of our speakers and the updates. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with all of you and really um, Feel like we're making some good progress on this topic so thank you for working with me and i will be in touch all right thank thanks you. emily